Take your Bibles this morning. Open up to the Gospel of Matthew. Praise the Lord. Did everybody have a great Christmas celebration? Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise if you did, if you were able to spend time with your family and friends. I know we had a, a house full of people yesterday, and it was just a beautiful, beautiful time fellowshipping and eating. Come on, how many know Sister Myra could cook? Come on, we, we did an untraditional meal. We had lasagna, pork chops. I was on the grill. Come on, somebody. Right? Peach cobbler, everything. I mean, it was... It was good. I, man, I had, was struggling trying to get to sleep. I ate so much food yesterday. Had to put on my suspenders today. Come on, somebody. But it's a blessing just to see everybody here this morning. And, and we're finishing. Come on, we're finishing the year. And we're finishing well. Amen. How I many you know 2021 and 2020 have been pretty tough years on people? Some people have lost loved ones. Some people have, you know gotten sick and, you know, when uh, their finances got attacked and emotions got attacked and it was, you know, it was one of those, uh, it was one of those years that we thought we were through it. Come on, somebody. But it just kept on going. But how many know God is still on the throne, right? So these last couple of years, they've been a trying time of year for us, but how many know God is the one who's in control this morning? And he's able. So I want you to know this morning that if you're here today, you're finishing well. And God's got something even greater up ahead for you. I mean, no, this, this pandemic can't stop what God wants to do inside of our lives. It can't stop what God wants to do. The only person that can stop what God, the devil can't even stop what God wants to do. The only person that can stop God from moving in our lives, you look at that person every day when you look in the mirror. It's yourself. And that's the only person, not, no, no thing, no trial, no problem, no person, no attack can stop what God wants to do. Just remember that God is a God who wants to do great things in our lives. And I feel that this morning. I feel that God wants to do something great in people's lives. Amen. I know I got you standing. Amen. But I, I got to stand for an hour. So I figure you could stand for a few more minutes. Amen. But in Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, we're going to read those scriptures. And it says like this. Now, after, somebody say after. after. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east. And look at what it says. And have come to worship him. Father, we pray this morning that your word would fall on good ground, God, and would produce fruit in our lives, God. I pray that you would give us direction, inspiration, and transformation today, God. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You can be seated. Praise God. You know, I, I, as I was looking at this scripture, I, I noticed that word after. Say after with me. I noticed that word after. Amen. And this tells me, this tells me after Christmas. Jesus was born, right? I mean, no, we celebrate the birth of Jesus on Christmas Day. But so what do we do after Christmas? What is our job after Christmas? Now that, now that it's over, now that some of you are in debt to your credit cards, come on, somebody. You went spending, use those credit cards. What about after? Now that the parties are over, the fellowships are over, and the loved ones are going home and all of that, what do we do after? Now that this whole year has gone by, right? 2021 is going to be in the books next, next Friday night, 12, 12, 12 o'clock at night. The year's over. What are we going to do after? After all those things that you've experienced, whether they're good or bad, Right? Whether they were successes or failures, what are you going to do after? What are you going to do after? What are you going to do after? Well, the wise men gives us the key right there. They said, we have come to worship him. How many know when it's all said and done, when it's all over, when everything is done, 
you still got to worship the Lord. No matter what you're going through, when, when you get through the trial, just keep worshiping the Lord. When you're in the middle of the trial, just keep worshiping the Lord. When you're starting out in trials, because I mean, no, they're going to come. Just remember, we have come to worship him. That's why we're here this morning. That's why you come to church. That's why Jesus wanted us. That's why he said, don't neglect the assembling of the brethren as some are in a habit of doing. That's why, he, that's why the Bible teaches us. That's why he said, for where two or three of you gather in my name, I'm there in the midst. Because God wants you to know that you're an instrument of praise and worship unto him. Can somebody say amen? amen. An instrument of praise and worship to the Lord. And that's what this story is. It's a, it's a familiar story. And a lot of times we use it as the Christmas story. But this is what happened after the birth of Jesus. I mean, no, there's always going to be an after, right? The Bible, the Bible says wise men came from the east, amen? Now, some scholars say these wise men were, were three kings who practiced astrology, right? I mean, no, we don't, we don't practice astrology anymore. Come on, somebody. We got the Bible now. We don't need, we don't need that stuff. That, forget about that sign. Whatever sign you were, forget about that. That ain't going to get you no place. Maybe even some scholars said these guys worship the stars. How I many know there's only one object of worship in our lives? And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, give him a hand of praise. Give him a hand of praise. Only one object of worship. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. But these guys, they were into the stars. And we know that they were wealthy men, they were educated men, and they were even highly respected men because they even came into an audience with the king. So we know they had a little something going on, these three men or these three wise men or these three kings. And we find that they were led by their studies of the stars, they were led to follow one star. Come on, somebody. They were led to follow one star. And that was the star that was there in Bethlehem, over Bethlehem, or what we call the star of Bethlehem. And it led them to the place where the master was birthed. And I don't know about you this morning, but I'm glad that I was led to a place where Jesus could be birthed into my life. Come on now. Where I could have that born again experience. Where I could come to know the Lord. As my savior. My master. And my Lord. Amen somebody. They were led. They were led by a heavenly object. What, what brought you to the house of God? What, what, what led you. To surrendering your life to Jesus? What led you. To coming to know Jesus as your Savior and your Lord. Can you remember that? Can you remember the events around your situation, your circumstance that ultimately led you into asking Jesus to come into your life? They might not have even been good, good circumstances. They might have, it might have been a, a, a very, very uh, painful experience that you had, but yet it led you. It led you to this place where you're at today. Oh, somebody needs to say amen. amen. So we find these three kings, these wise men, they were led by a heavenly object. They saw that star. That, that star must have stood out above all the other stars, and they saw that star, and they were led by that heavenly object to the place where baby Jesus was. Amen? Amen. Some, some people say it was 12 days after his birth. And that's where a lot, of, a lot of people say that's where they come up with the 12 days of Christmas, right? On the 12th day of Christmas, my true love gave to me. Come on, somebody. I don't know if that's true or not. 
But I know the Bible does say they were three wise men. The Bible does say they saw a star. And the Bible does say that star led them to Jesus. Come on, somebody. They were led to the place where Jesus was birthed. They were also led by a promise. In Numbers 24, 17, it says like this, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. It was, it was, it was a prophetic star. It was a, a star of promise. How many know we are a prophetic people? We are a people of promise today. And it's because of that promise that God gave to us, many of us have come into a relationship with God. And there's still many, many more that we're going to come in contact with. And because of the promise that God has given to us, they too will come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior and their Lord. Come on. How many know what I'm talking about? There, there's some people here today that you hold that promise in your heart. And wherever you go, you share the love of Jesus Christ to others. And because you have that promise in your heart, these people one day will walk into the house of God with their hands lifted up. Come on, somebody. Saying, praise the Lord. They too will be able to say, like you say today, we have come to worship him. See, in the Old Testament, you got to understand, God used manifestations, supernatural manifestations. Do you ever, do you ever pray for that? Do you ever pray, God, God, I need a, I need a supernatural manifestation. I need a, I need your manifested presence in my life. Cause I know God's presence is here. God is everywhere, right? But I love it when God's manifested presence shows up. And I feel this morning as I came into the house of the Lord and saw people at the altar worshiping, and as I listened to the music, I, you know, I, I, I heard different sounds, and I, I thought I was hearing guitars and trumpets, and, and I, I thought I was hearing an orchestra playing. The worship was so anointed. See, God used supernatural manifestations. He used the Shekinah glory in the Old Testament to lead the children of Israel from Egypt to the promised land. A pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day to cover them. God's manifested presence. He used water from a rock. Can you imagine that? Water coming out of a rock. That would be the last place I would go looking for water. I would look it for it in a lake. Right? In a pond. But the last place I would think God's manifested presence would come was by, would, would be by coming through a rock. Water gushing out of a rock. So don't despise what God is doing. Some of those places you find yourself in, they're rocky. They're hard. They're difficult. It's in those type of places where God manifests his life changing power. And he does it to lead people into his promises. Just as God the Father, I believe this with all my heart, God the Father in heaven was leading the wise men to Jesus. And the same way God the Father in heaven led them to the Lord, God the Father wants to lead you and I into a deeper relationship with God. And the way that you can go deeper in your relationship with God is when you experience God's presence in your life. God wants to lead us to his son Jesus. In John 6, it reads like this. It says, for no one can come to me. This is Jesus. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me. Unless the Father who sent me draws them to me. How many know this morning God has drawn you to him today? If you're here today, maybe you're here for the very first time. Maybe you're a return guest. Maybe this is your church. I want you to know it's no coincidence that you are here today. God has brought you here 
today because he wants to do a special work in your life. It's important. It's important for everyone here today to know that they are being led by the Spirit of God. Watch this. God is leading you. He's leading us. We're, we're, it's so important for us to know that, that we're being led by the Spirit of God because sometimes we get in places that we don't want to be. Sometimes we, we experience things that we don't want to experience. But if you know that the Spirit of God is leading you, you'll know that it's going to be okay. So it's important to be led for the, by the Spirit, and it's important to know that you're being led by the Spirit. Because no matter what happens, you know God is still in control. Come on, somebody. You can just... You can just Kick back, come on somebody, when all hell is breaking loose and chaos is going on, you can just kick back and you can have peace because you know that God is in the midst of your life. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. It's important. Romans 8, 14 says, for all who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God. Any of God's children here this morning? Come on, any of God's children here this morning? So it's important to be led, and it's important to know that you're being led. It was important for these wise men to know that because they were gonna they were gonna go in front of King Herod and they were gonna say, No, we're coming, we're coming to worship Jesus. We're looking for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, meaning that could have been a dangerous thing for them to say. But they didn't care. Why didn't they care? Because they knew God was leading them. Okay? So there's three things that I see in this story that are, are worth us looking at this morning that, that the, wise men, the wise men did. The first thing the wise men represent to us this morning, the wise men represent the future coming of Gentile nations. They, they are like a type of you and I. Gentile or unbelievers coming to a holy God. They represent that. They were, they were a prophetic picture of Gentile nations or unbelievers coming to worship the Messiah, the God, the King, the Master. They're a picture or they're a type of us. They represent you and I today. When we look at them, we can see ourselves, even though we're not kings, come on somebody, some of us aren't educated, we're not wealthy, but we know we've come here this morning to worship the Lord. I, I, you know, as I was praying this morning, a song came to my mind that we used to sing when I first got saved. And it, it, it kind of goes like this. We have come into this place to magnify his name and worship him. We have come into this place to magnify his name and worship him. So forget about yourself and magnify his name and worship Christ our Lord. Worship him. Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's how you do it. Come on, somebody. That's who we are. That's, that's why, watch this, it doesn't, come, it, it doesn't come natural to us. We weren't raised uh, to worship the Lord. We weren't raised uh, to be, you know, a, a worshiper. We're, we didn't come out of the background uh, of that type of worship and, and praise. But it doesn't matter because God has led us here today. We know we can just worship the King of Kings. Amen. When, when they asked Herod where the Messiah was to be born... When they, when they came and they, were, and they wanted direction on where to go, they were literally putting their lives at risk asking a question like that. Because no king would tolerate any other king to be worshipped. 
They didn't care because they understood God has called them. God has led them to a place to worship. They understood this about Jesus, that, that that baby that they saw, that little baby boy that they saw was the real king of all kings. See, we've come into this place this morning to worship the king of all kings. The Bible says that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. Every knee shall bow. That's why it, it, it should come as you serve the Lord, it should come, be a part of you to bow down and worship God. To bow things down or bow down my feelings, bow down my thoughts, bow down my desires and leave them at the feet of Jesus. See, these men, these three guys, what, what I believe made them wise men is they were willing to give up everything for a relationship with Jesus Christ. They were willing to give it all up. You know, we're, we're, we're kind of in those days. And I've been thinking a lot about this lately. We're living in those times where instead of people wanting to surrender their lives to God, instead of people wanting to lay their lives at the foot of the altar, become a living sacrifice. We're living in those days now where people are looking for what God can give them, what God can do for them. I read a, I read a, a, a little story. I'm going to read it to you. I wasn't planning on it, but I'm going to read it to you. I got it from uh, one pastor, famous pastor. He wrote this, and it really ministered to me. Let me read this to you. Talking about the birth of Jesus. Pay attention to this. Look up here and pay attention. Come on. Eyes on me. Because this might change your life. He was born in an obscure village. The child of a peasant woman. He grew up in still another village where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. Then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. Watch this. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never had a family or even owned a house. He didn't go to college. He never traveled more than 200 miles from the place he was born. He did none of the things, watch this, he did none of the things one usually associates with greatness or success. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33 when public opinion turned against him. His friends deserted him. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. When he was dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing, the only property he had. When he was dead, there was a, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Nineteen centuries have come and gone, and today he's the central figure of the human race. The leader of mankind's progress. All the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all the parliaments that ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned, put together have not affected the life of man on earth as much as that one man, Jesus Christ. Man, that thing, when I read that, 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 that hit me. Because we're living in a time, listen to me, we're living in a time where the enemy wants your attention off of serving Jesus and he wants you to put your attention on serving yourself. What is, in, what is in it for me? I got to look out for me. But that's the way the world thinks. That's the, that's the way that man thinks that is not saved, unregenerated. Man thinks like that. But as a child of God, we should be thinking, what can I do to advance the kingdom? What can I do to get the word out? What can I do to minister 
to others about this great love. No greater love can a man have than he laid down his life for his friend. How can I get that out? And I'm not saying don't take care of yourself, don't care, take care of your family. But I'm saying this, when God is in it, he'll take better care of you than you could take care of yourself. These wise men, they, they must have understood that because they left their palace, they left their, their, their place, even their place of worship maybe. They were a king, maybe people honored them and worshiped them, but they left that to go and worship Jesus. See, my question today, are we as Christians willing to leave things behind so we could come to worship the Lord. They were willing to give up their lives for a relationship with Jesus Christ. These Gentile kings, these they, they were they were they were they were following a promise. They were following God's plan for their life. Second thing that sticks, stands out to me about these guys is they represent a real choice that everybody will have to make. They represent a choice that we have to make every day. This isn't a one-day choice. This isn't a choice that I made 30-something years ago when I gave my life to Jesus or you made 10, 15, 20 years ago when you gave your life to the Lord or, or last week when you surrendered to the Lord. This is a choice that you have to make every day. You have to choose every day. I'm going to serve God. You have to choose every day, I'm going to worship God. It's not just one made, but it's one we have to make. It's one we have to make every day. See, these guys, these wise men or these three kings, they had a choice of two kings. They had a choice of two kings because you guys know the story. Herod, he was jealous of Jesus. He didn't want to share his glory with no other king. And he was, at that time, he was the sovereign king. And I'm here today to, to, to tell you today that the devil, he wants all the glory. He wants all the attention. He wants all the worship. They had a choice they had to make. They had the choice of bowing down and worshiping Herod and obeying him. And doing what he wanted, or they had the choice of following that star. Watch this. Watch this. You know the star led them to? It led them to a stable. How many of you ever been in a barn? A stable where animals live. Versus a palace. Come on. Versus a palace where a king lived. Most people today would choose the palace. Where God says, no, I want you in the stable. Come on, somebody. See, one king, Herod, was in Jerusalem, and the other king, Jesus, was in Bethlehem. And it would be easy for these three kings, these three wise men, to be overtaken by Herod's wealth and power. Just like a lot of people, they're consumed with Money, respect, and power. They're, they're consumed. Paul had a disciple. Paul the apostle had a disciple named Demas. Demas was a good guy. Demas was a disciple. But Paul says this about him. Demas has departed from me, having loved this present world. When you, when you research Demas' life, what it says about Demas, what they say is, Demas made a choice not to continue on the missionary field and he made a choice to go back to the secular field. Now we kind of we kind of have to go into the secular and into the spiritual as a practice, right? We have to we have to learn how to balance the the secular life, come on somebody, with the spiritual life. But we need to understand that the spiritual life always trumps the secular life. The spiritual life will always trump your secular life. 
And these wise men, they had a choice. They had a choice between Herod and Jesus. Herod's wealth and power versus Jesus' beauty. Listen, beauty is just a cute baby boy. Like the babies we have in our church. We have a couple newborns in our church. And they're just cute, right? They were taking a picture. David was taking a picture, him and Maritza, with their baby. And uh, the baby just decided to stick her tongue out. <laughs> right? And everybody said when they saw the picture, oh, how cute. Right? Is that that's you know that's just what babies are. Babies are cute. They do they do things that it don't matter what they do. How cute. Right? And they had a choice that they had to make. And something in their hearts told them that their journey was not over. When they got to Herod's palace, something told them that there was more to their journey than this. Because they were looking for a real living Savior. How many know the God that we serve? The God that we serve is a living Savior. And one day Jesus is going to come back for his people. He's going to come back just as alive as I'm standing here today. We're going to see him a living Savior in all his majesty and all his glory and all his power. Tell somebody next to you, your journey is not over. Don't get stuck in the palace. God wants to take you all the way to the manger. I tell you, the manger is a much better place to be when you're looking for a savior. Right? Right? Geographically, it's only a short distance from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. Just a short walk. But spiritually, they're worlds apart. They're worlds apart. That spiritual life, that, 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 that presence of God in your life leading you to worship God. God wants to do that in us, church. God wants to bring this church into a place of worship, where it's going to be a tangible experience of the presence of God showing up. That's what he wants. That's, what, that's, what, that's what's going to happen. I can feel it. That's what's going to happen. But everybody has to be in that mindset. We have to be in that mindset that we've come to worship him. I'm not coming here if I, just because I feel good or because, of, because I have to. No, it's none of that. I might feel good. I might not feel good. I might have to. I might not have to. But the reason that I'm coming here, I'm coming to worship him. We have to get that mindset like these three wise men, these three kings. They had a mindset. We have come. We, we went through all of this. We took this journey because we've come to worship Jesus. Come into this place to magnify his name, to worship him. Amen? I believe the reason that they were wise men is because they knew that. They understood that. They understood Herod is not their king. And I got to keep going because I got to serve Jesus. So they represent a choice that everybody's going to have to make. And you're going to have to make it every day. You're going to have to make it every day because the enemy would love to sidetrack you. The enemy would just love, I'm telling you, he will love to sidetrack you. That's why he uses different things in our life. He uses different detours and deceptions in our life because he wants to get God's people off track. And he does it in a way, watch this, he does it where he just tweaks it just a little bit. He'll just tweak it just a little bit. But if you're, if you're setting sail across the sea and you're one degree off in your calculations of your trip, you'll be so far away by the time you arrive at the destination you're going to arrive at. You'll be so far away from where you're going, it will be impossible to get to it. And that's how the enemy is. He wants to just give you a little 
just a little deception. He makes it, he makes it seem normal. He makes it, he makes it seem like it's nothing, but just a little off track with the Lord. After a year, after two years, after three years, you find yourself way far away. Can I hear you say amen? So we have to make the right choice. The Bible talks about choices that we must make to serve the Lord. One of the most famous scriptures is in Joshua where it says, choose this day. This day, I'm going to choose. This day, right now, I'm going to choose to worship the Lord. That's how you got you to gotta get up. I'm going to choose to be a worshiper. I'm going to choose to give God the glory, the honor, the power, and the praise. I choose this. Thirdly, these wise men represent how we should come to the Lord in worship. How we should, the, 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 the mindset or the attitude that we should have as we're coming to Jesus. Number one, the Bible says they came and they acknowledged him. You know how they did that? They bowed down on their knee and they acknowledged Jesus. I've learned this in my life. If there's anything in my life that will not bow to the Lord, it's no good for me. If there's any relationship that cannot bow to the Lord, it's no good for me. If there's any source of success that will not bow to the Lord, it's no good for me. The first thing these wise men did, they came in and they bowed down and they acknowledged him. As their king. Bible says if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus, you'll be saved. That's bowing down. The Bible says trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. But in all your ways acknowledge him and he'll make your path straight. That's bowing down. See the first thing they did, they came into that place. They came in and they bowed their heart to the Lord. They represent an invitation to take our whole life, not just part of it, but my whole life into the kingdom of God and to learn how to live that God, Holy Spirit, Jesus-empowered lifestyle. Come into that place. God has given that. They teach us today that when we undertake any activity, we're not doing them on our own power. We're doing them in the confidence, vision, and expectation that God is going to be with me. I believe that's what kept me for so long is I know God is with me. I know God is with me. I know God is with me. I know, I know the Lord saved me. I know the Lord raised me. I know God is with me. God is with us, church. He's with you today. I, I want you to know, acknowledge his presence in your life. Give him the glory, the honor, the praise. For every success, I was thinking, I was thinking on the way, I was thinking driving, driving to church, I had this thought about, the different things that God did in people's lives in our church. And I was thinking about some of you guys, how some of you had kids, you know, you, you rejoiced in the birth of your, 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 your children. Man, that's a great, you know, in a pandemic, that's, that's something, I mean, that's something to celebrate. Some of you gotten better jobs and God's raised you up on your job. I mean, no, that's something, that's something to celebrate. I was thinking of the new people that have come in and, and given their life to the Lord and, and become a part of our church in this past year. That's something to celebrate. God has been good to us. God has been good to us. But let's always remember, God is the source. He's the source. The Bible says every good gift and every perfect gift comes from God. Every good gift and every perfect gift. Bow down and worship him. Give him the glory. Give him the honor. 
See, the wise men, they came in to that, to that stable, to that manger, and they declared, we have come in for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to worship God. That is to worship God. Jesus declared our purpose to us when he said in Matthew 6, verse 33, he said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and then all other things will be added unto you. My purpose and your purpose here today is to bow before the Lord, the king of heaven and earth, and worship him. They acknowledged him. They acknowledge Jesus. Every good thing that has happened to me has happened to me because of the Lord. Every good thing. I can take no credit for it. God just put me in the right place with the right people, and he did the rest. Just remember that. Every good thing that has happened, all the successes, all the breakthroughs, God keeping us. Now we're celebrating another year of God's keeping power upon our lives. Amen. Acknowledge that. Acknowledge that. The second thing they did when they came in is they came in and they rejoiced. The Bible says in Matthew 2.10, look at what it says. When they saw the star, the star they were overjoyed. It doesn't say they were just joyful. It's one thing to be joyful. It's one thing to be happy. But the Bible says they were overjoyed. I think the church needs to get to that place of being overjoyed. Where you're more excited than people think you need to be. You're more in love with God than people. People are going to look at you like something strange going on with you. I'm overjoyed. That means they were ecstatic. You know, I, in my mind, I picture them when they, when, they, when they came in, they jumped up and clicked their heels together. Oh, boy, whoopee. They were overjoyed. In other words, there was a joy that they experienced like they've never, ever experienced before. Bible calls it joy unspeakable and full of glory. Do you know there's a joy that you could experience like none other? David knew that. You know, King David knew that. When he messed up, he said, Lord, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. You know what happens? Sometimes what happens to us is life. Come on, somebody. Sometimes life happens to you. And sometimes you lose the joy of God's salvation. You know, I misquoted that verse for many years. I used to say, Lord, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Got nothing to do with me. This joy I'm talking about got nothing to do with you. It's got nothing to do with us. It's everything to do with him. It is the joy of thy salvation. I want to be overjoyed in 2022. Come on, somebody. I want to be overjoyed. I want to have a joy like no other I've ever experienced. I want, to, I want that joy to be bubbling inside of me. The Bible says it like this in the Message Bible. It says they could hardly contain themselves. It was like they were like standing like, they were so ecstatic. You know, they just, they couldn't, they just couldn't let it out. They're trying to hold back and be dignified because remember, they were kings. Listen, church, it's time to get undignified. If that dignity is keeping you from worshiping the Lord. I was standing right here during the worship, and I don't know what came over Sister Margaret, but I got excited. Because she was, she was worshiping the Lord, and she was like pounding. Come on, somebody. She was pounding. That's what we need. We need more of that. Can I hear you say amen? 
We need more of that. We don't, man, we're just going to let the spirit have its way inside of our life. And we're going to be ecstatic. We're going to be overjoyed. We're going to have an experience like we've never had. Some of us need to get back into that place of being joyful. Even James said, count it all joy. When you fall into diverse temptations or different types of trials or trials of various colors, count it all joy. It's okay. That's a good thing when you have the joy of the Lord. Nehemiah said it's the joy of the Lord that gives us strength. So they became overjoyed. Church, we got to get overjoyed. Come on, somebody. We got to get, get overjoyed. Not just joyful, but overjoyed. You know, that's kind of like when you get, you get saved, you first get saved, you can hardly contain yourself. You want to tell everybody about your salvation. You want to worship. You want to witness. You want to get involved. You want to, you want to tell the world about Jesus. We should never, ever graduate from that place. And it's sad. Many people have graduated from the place of being overjoyed with the presence of God. But these guys came in, and they were overjoyed. Thirdly, when they came in, they came in and they honored Jesus as their king. That's why we do this. That's why we do, we close our eyes and we just lift up hands. Because we're giving God all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. They honored him as their king. In verse 11 of chapter 2 it says, when they came to the house and they saw Jesus, they bowed down and they worshiped. They knew they were not just in a house. They knew they were not just <coughs> in a building. They knew they were not just in a church service. Come on, somebody. But they were in God's house. And they were in the presence of a holy God. They, were, they knew that there was something diff different about this place that we're in. There's something unordinary, extraordinary, something that is just totally different. It was the presence of God in that place. And watch this. Because the presence of God was there, they were able to look past all the smell. Come on, I mean, no, it was a little stinky at times. Right? They were able to look past all the poverty because he wasn't in a palace. They were, they were able to look past what they didn't have. See, what do we see? What do you and I see when we come into the house of God? Do we only notice the smell? Do we only see what's missing? Do we only focus on what's wrong? Or do we put our focus and our attention on Jesus Christ? Do we notice that we're in the presence of a holy God? Do you know that today? You're in the presence of a holy God. God, when we come together, they honored him. They honored him as their king. And Paul wrote to Timothy, he taught him about in a great house or in the church, there's many vessels, people, right? In a great house, in the house of God. The church is a great house. It's a great house. And there's many vessels, people. And he said there's some for honor and some for dishonor. But he says if a man or a woman will separate themselves from the latter, they'll become a vessel of honor. I wonder how many vessels of honor are in the house today. I wonder how many of us are, are, are daily saying, man, I'm going to separate myself unto the Lord. I'm going to separate myself to live for Jesus. I'm going to choose today. And lastly, when they came in, the Bible says that they, they gave. It's verse 11, the last part, it says, When they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They opened up their treasure. That word open their treasure means to be completely open. 
to be open. Church, be open. Be open to what God wants to do. Don't close yourself. Open yourself up to what God wants to do in your life. When you come into the house of God, open up your heart. Don't hold back, but surrender everything to Jesus. That's worship. We've come into this place to magnify his name and to worship him. Don't hold it back. When it's time to worship the Lord, when it's time to honor the Lord, when it's time to give to the Lord, don't hold back no more. Just surrender. Give it all to God. You know, it's this day today, and it's not a cliche, and it's not just I'm going to say it, for the sake of saying it, but this last service service of the year has significance for us. It has significance. It really does. This last day of the year, just like the first day of the year and every day of the year, for that matter of fact. But on this day today, how we end this day sets the pace for how we're going to start next year how we finish today how we finish this service how we finish serving the Lord today how we end this year is going to determine our start for next year and that's why it's so important for us to understand the importance of worship the importance of praise, the importance of glorifying the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because it will make a world of difference for you in 2022. What, let's say, what if this pandemic continues another year? What, what if the hardships and the trials that you've experienced in 21 and 20 continue in 22. Let's say, what if it doesn't change or get better? Will you still be here? Will you still be here in the last service of 22? What if things don't change? What if, what if it doesn't get better for you? Will you still have a heart of worship? Will you still be able to be at the altar like you were this morning? Will you still be able to say God is my king? He is the Lord of my life. He is my master, my redeemer. You know what will make a difference for that? Is if you keep your heart open to the Lord. Don't let the enemy close your heart. You remember the story how they had to reopen the wells that the enemy plugged up. The enemy's always looking to plug your well of worship. And worship isn't just hallelujah, Jesus, and sing a few songs on Sunday. No, worship is your service. Worship is the way you live for God, the way you represent the Lord, the, way, the, 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 the actions and the attitudes that we take. I declare today, church, we have come to worship him. We've come with an open heart. We've, we've come at the risk of whatever, but we're going to continue to follow the Spirit's leading, and we're going to continue to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Can I hear you say amen? Come on, let's all stand to our feet. Let's all stand to our feet all over this room.